Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to have been asked to speak at this important conference on the topic of judicial conduct. Um, I'd like to do three things in the course of my remarks. First, I'd like to put the judicial conduct element of the work of the, of the Judicial Council in the context of the work of the Council as a whole. I'd then like to rehearse what are often well-established arguments for why we need a, a conduct element to the Judicial Council. And finally, I would update you on where we stand in the process of having the conduct regime up and running. On the first, there has been talk of a Judicial Council for a very long time. Um, I made the declaration to become a judge of the High Court on the 18th of November 2004. And the very next day, my first day in the job, as it were, I attended the National, uh, the National Conference of the Judiciary. And we were presented with a paper from my predecessor, then ordinary judge of the Supreme Court, Susan Denham, which was entitled Judicial Independence and Integrity, uh, Whither a Judicial Council Now? And this is, remember, 17 years ago. And at that, that time, Judge Denham was able to say in her report, the matter of establishing a Judicial Council has been considered in the last eight years by a working group on a court's commission, the Committee on Judicial Conduct and, and Ethics, a Judicial Conference, an all-party Oireachtas Committee on the Constitution in its fourth progress report on the courts and the judiciary, the Constitution Review Group, the Government and Legislature in a proposed constitutional amendment, and a bill drafted by the Committee on Judicial Conduct and Ethics with the assistance of the Law Reform Commission. So it's fairly clear that a Judicial Council in one form or another has been under active consideration for a quarter of a century the 17 years since that paper and the eight years before it. And while the precise components of a Judicial Council have been the subject of varying uh, debates over time, uh, there's no doubt that a Judicial Conduct element was always considered to be an important part of it, but by no means uh, the only part of it. Uh, so that might lead to the question of uh, why uh, did we need some form of new judicial conduct regime in Ireland. Well, I suppose the starting point has to be to go back to the well-explored uh, argument that the only uh, method for disciplining judges under current conditions is the constitutional provision which allows for a judge to be removed from office as a result of a resolution in that regard uh, passed by both houses of the Oireachtas in, in respect of either incapacity or, or stated misbehaviour. Um, that's a process which got off the ground once uh, and was contemplated on a second occasion, but has never actually come to fruition. But, but leaving that aside, which will of course remain the ultimate uh, sanction that might be imposed a, a, upon a judge, um, it's clearly the case that there may be issues of judicial conduct which would warrant intervention by an appropriate body but which would fall short, and in some cases far short, of the kind of conduct which might justify removal from office. And it's in that context that I see the work of the Judicial Council as broadly involving, at a very high level, a series of measures which are designed to enhance confidence in the judiciary, but doing so in two broad strands. The first strand, which is already up and running, involved creating a greater degree of consistency in the areas of uh, sentencing and the award of personal injuries uh, for, for, for general damages. And of course, <clears throat> they sound like very different areas, but in one sense, they are similar. Uh, they involve matters where there is a subjective element, particularly in converting a degree of severity, whether it be the severity of injury suffered or the severity of a crime and all the circumstances surrounding a crime into a number. In that even if there was broad agreement that this injury was twice as bad as this one or this crime in all its uh, manifestations was warranted a sentence twice as big as that one, there's no absolutely objective way of converting those into sums of money or, or, or periods of imprisonment or, or other penalty. So that's one strand designed to enhance confidence because by bringing some degree of consistency and perhaps transparency as well 
to the process of converting those matters into numbers. But the, the other three elements, main elements uh, of the regime involve judicial training, uh, involve the judicial conduct uh, committee with which we're, con which we're considering today, and also, I, th I think, importantly, a welfare element, and that's something I'll come back to. But they are collectively designed to improve the standards of judiciary, of our judiciary, or perhaps in many cases maintaining high standards that have already been established. I think it's fair to say that most international surveys do place the Irish judiciary in the upper uh, layers of confidence held by the public in their independence and in the way in which they conduct their business. And there always seemed to me to be an interaction between those three elements of training, conduct and welfare. Uh, not every case of bad conduct can be put down to a lack of training, but some can. Not every case of bad conduct can be put down to a welfare issue where the judge is perhaps under pressure or unwell, but some can. And there can be no doubt that better training and an effective welfare system may divert some cases uh, out of existence, as it were, by preventing them arising in the first place. But of course, there will be some cases where oh, however good your training and however good your backup welfare systems are will nonetheless result in issues of conduct which need to be dealt with. Um, the regime that is specified in the Judicial Council Act is quite specific in respect of the Conduct uh, Committee. Uh, the Conduct Committee consists of judges, uh, the five court presidents, three elected judges, and five lay members who were appointed uh, as a result of a process undertaken by the Public Appointment Service, although the formal uh, appointment was made by the government. Uh, <clears throat> that committee has overall control uh, of the conduct system, but the detail of that system to quite some degree uh, is specified in the legislation. And for example, if we go back to the welfare issue, there is the possibility of a complaint being diverted into a welfare issue if the conduct committee is of the view that, that a, a health problem of a judge was the cause of potentially uh, misconduct which would need to be dealt with, uh, but where uh, dealing with the health issue is a more appropriate way of handling the matter and provided that the judge agrees the matter doesn't have to go down a conduct route at all and that's something that applies in a number of professional disciplinary models. Um, there is a role for the registrar of the Judicial Council who can be the same person as the secretary but depending on the workload that ultimately emerges it may or may not be necessary to have a separate person as registrar, but for the moment, the, the secretary of the Judicial Council will act as registrar, and that person will make an initial decision as to the admissibility of complaints. Um, a case where the registrar deems a complaint to be inadmissible can be appealed to a review committee. So there's quite an elaborate entry process, if you like, or threshold process to determine those cases which have to go forward for a full inquiry. And indeed, one of the matters which the Judicial Conduct Committee had to deal with was to put in place detailed procedures. And that turned out to be a more extensive process than perhaps we had envisaged at the beginning, but precisely because a lot of the detail of the process is hardwired in the legislation, and therefore there was less scope uh, for uh, uh, procedures being put in place uh, that, that were, as it were, uh, considered appropriate by the committee because the committee clearly had to operate within the, the parameters of, of the legislation. Um, <clears throat> the uh, investigation end is then the next stage if a case is found to be admissible. Um, and again, there are investigation committees with lay members, different people have been appointed, again, through a public appointment service process uh, with a view to uh, those persons uh, being members on a rotation of investigation committees when they're set up. And ultimately, the matter 
if it's well founded, comes back to the Judicial Conduct Committee itself for the purposes of uh, determining what sanction is ultimately to be deployed. Uh, the system is clearly not yet up and running and I'll come to where we are in that process as yet. So uh, what I say at the moment is somewhat theoretical. It's about what we anticipate uh, might be the case. Um, but I would hope that with enhanced training, it may well be uh, that there will be in the long run less complaints uh, than might otherwise be the case. And the training process is already well up and running. Um, and I know that the organizers of this conference have also already organized a conference on the training function. And it's perhaps worth just adding uh, as an addendum to that process that we have already reached a stage where judges are receiving um, induction training. Indeed, the four new high court judges who were uh, sworn in by me as one of my last formal acts as Chief Justice on the 7th of October had between the date of their nomination as judges and their finally being able to take up office, uh, ha having made the declarations which are required of them under the Constitution, had already had uh, some induction training, including courtroom simulations using the courtroom in Green Street, which is the premises now being used uh, by the Judicial Council. So we've already moved quite some way. And also we are at the stage from the perspective of the Judicial Council as a whole, uh, that a problem which we had encountered in being able to employ persons who will be civil servants and where you can't just therefore go out and buy a simple employer package uh, to, to manage your employees has now been solved so that the budget which we have already had allocated to us can now be spent on employing extra staff. Some of that additional staff will be required to manage the conduct regime as it were and clearly we're not absolutely sure as to the scale of complaints that there will be at this stage but we've taken a I suppose an educated guess based on the experience of other similar jurisdictions but also some of that additional staff will enhance the training function and will allow the judicial director of the, the training scheme, uh, Ms. Justice Mary Rose Geerty, uh, to provide more of her planned uh, uh, educational facilities. So we're now at a stage where that model is, as it were, ready to launch. And therefore, what I propose to do is to briefly outline the stage that we are at, how we've got to be where we are. And while it won't happen on my watch, what may happen next? Uh, firstly, as I mentioned, it was necessary to establish the Judicial Conduct Committee. Uh, the legislation provided that that had to be in place uh, by a date in uh, late June um, because of the establishment date of the Judicial Council itself. Um, but it was necessary to have the lay persons in place before that committee could function. Uh, and it took some time for the process through the Public Appointments Service uh, to generate the names. Uh, those persons had to be vetted before they were formally appointed uh, by the government. Uh, and unlike, for example, the uh, Personal Injury Guidelines Committee, which consisted solely of judges, uh, where it was therefore possible to arrange for it to meet informally in advance of its formal establishment, I was very concerned that it could not be said that the judges who were going to be members of the conduct committee uh, could have, as it were, jumped the gun over the lay members by allowing them to meet in advance of a proper meeting of the full conduct committee, including the lay members. So it really couldn't start until the lay members were appointed, uh, but it held its first meeting as soon as that was practically possible after the appointment of those lay members. So there was certainly no delay on the point from the perspective of the Judicial Council in getting the Conduct Committee up and running. It identified at an early stage the need to do three uh, important things. One was its statutory function in producing uh, the ethical guidelines, and I'll come back to that in a moment. The second was to produce the procedures to which I've already referred, uh, consistent with the legislation, but putting flesh on the, the bones of the legislative scheme. Uh, and the third was to uh, work out uh, a process for dealing with the informal resolution procedure, which is also referred to 
in in the legislation, which allows for um, cases to be more or less dealt with on consent, where the arrangements are, are such that the person making the complaint is happy with whatever resolution is suggested without it needing to go to a formal uh, disciplinary process. Um, the way in which it was worked was that the Judicial uh, Conduct Committee divided into a number of subgroups, each of which consisted of some judges and some laypersons, to deal with those three issues. Though in time it became clear that there was such a connection between the informal resolution uh, limb of the process and the full investigation limb of the process that those two were amalgamated. So it ended up with really two different strands, the production of the guidelines, the ethical guidelines, and the production of the detailed procedures that will allow complaints to be dealt with, whether informally or through a, a full investigative process. Uh, <clears throat> The uh, group dealing with ethical guidelines uh, produced, investigated many uh, international comparators, uh, looked at matters such as the Bangalore principles in particular, uh, and produced a detailed set of guidelines. I've seen it suggested that it wouldn't have been easy just to adopt one of these international models. Uh, and in fairness, th there is a lot of experience out there on which we could draw. But it is necessary to also have a, a national element because there can be different conditions that do justify at least different elements of detail. Just to take one example, um, many international guidelines, including the Bang Bangalore principles, suggest that a judge should never allow that judge's home to be used for the conduct of legal business, a very understandable proposition. But if you take the situation in Ireland where, for example, many young barristers uh, work from home, uh, do their business from home, uh, until they reach the stage where they can afford an office. Uh, <clears throat> and where, in my experience, over the last uh, 18 months, when we've been conducting uh, remote hearings of, uh, of the Supreme Court, many uh, of the bar were addressing the court from uh, a well-set-up uh, uh, facility within their own home. Uh, and are we to say that we don't need some slight leeway in Ireland for that kind of situation? I think the answer is we do. Uh, or, or else you're going to place a much bigger burden on young barristers. So some of the international models did need a bit of tweaking for Irish conditions, but nonetheless, a great deal of assistance could be gleaned from them. And I think when they're ultimately adopted, they will follow very closely the general drift of the main international uh, models. The uh, Conduct Committee has now adopted the, uh, a set of ethical guidelines and the procedure under the Act is that they go to the board uh, of the Judicial Council, which can adopt or amend them. The board put them out to consultation among the, judiciary, among the judiciary generally. That consultation process is more or less finished. And I think the next step would be for the board to consider whatever uh, re comments have been made by members of the judiciary and come up with a final version of the conduct guidelines. Those guidelines will then have to go to a full meeting of the Judicial Council. The process is similar to the adoption of the personal injury guidelines, a committee followed by the board, followed by a full meeting of the council. Uh, that council meeting will have to happen, I would have thought, in the earlier part of next year, possibly at the general annual meeting of the uh, Judicial Council, which is due for February of next year. Once those guidelines are adopted, then it will be open to the Minister for Justice to uh, commence the as yet uncommenced sections of the Judicial Council Act, which provide for the apparatus for complaints. And in parallel with that, it will be necessary for the Judicial Council to have in place both the IT st uh, structures and the personnel structures to manage those complaints. But work is well advanced on putting those in place. As I've mentioned, the procedures have already been agreed and they don't have to go to the board or the council. They are now fixed. Uh, and therefore ready to run as soon as the guidelines are in place and formally adopted and the legislation commenced. So I think it would be fair to say we are at an advanced stage, uh, but there are still a few further stages to be, uh, to be carried out before it can go live, as it were. But it would be my expectation that the full conduct regime will go live sometime in the first half of next year. Um, exactly how it will work in practice is a matter which only time will tell. 
Um, you can do the best you can, but you can never anticipate every twist and turn uh, th that may emerge. Uh, but I think we have so far done a good job in producing uh, guidelines which will be up to the highest international standards uh, and a process which will allow for the effective and transparent dealing with complaints. Uh, but perhaps we need another conference in a couple of years' time to ascertain whether uh, that has worked in practice or whether it needs some further tweaking. And one should always uh, be willing to accept that there may be need for further tweaking. Thank you very much.